Hello and welcome. I'm Captain Chris Lee, Communications Chair for the FedEx Master Executive Council. With me today is MEC Chair Captain Chris Norman and MEC Negotiating Committee Chair Captain Pat May. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Thanks, Chris. Chris. Thanks for coming and listening to this video, watching this video. It's a little different than what we normally do. We hope this will be helpful uh, to get information out to you. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time. Uh, today we're going to talk about SPSC activities, MEC authorization for a strike vote and what that means to the pilots, the impact of other tentative agreements at other airline properties, our remaining open items, and the next steps regarding future mediated negotiations. And Chris, I'm going to start with you. Uh, can you give us an overview of the SPSC activities? Yes, I can, Chris. Uh, thank you. Uh, the Strategic Preparedness and Strike Committee, or SPSC, is currently running a campaign to ensure all pilots are properly connected to the union. The committee needs to ensure that your phone number, email address, and street address are up to date. We are encouraging all pilots to sign a protect caster. Future SPSC notifications will come through various methods to include the text caster. Additionally, the SPSC is finalizing various plans that will be used throughout the rest of the RLA process. In the near term, pilots have access to various educational products that are important to a possible strike vote and beyond. Finally, the SPSC and Family Awareness Committees are continuing to bring MEC leadership to domiciles and major commuting cities throughout the system. Chris, can you talk about some SPSC activities that we're looking at later in the calendar? Yes, our team is always evaluating new opportunities and events. These activities are not time-based, rather they are event-based. Events at the negotiating table drive planned activities such as informational picketing, pub calls, and other events. Driven by FedEx, sometimes uh, these events that are critical in nature, um, we will react to those too. These events include public business announcements, earning reports, and other publicly available information such as stock buybacks. We have activities that are planned all the way through May of this year, which you know will be the two-year mark from our opener. Well, Chris, as we move further down the RLA path that we're on, we're obviously approaching a point where the parties could potentially reach an impasse. What's the MEC doing to prepare for that outcome? Well, first, it's important to understand that we prefer that the company show up and close out this deal. But to answer your question, I have asked the MEC to give me, as chairman, the authorization to commence a strike vote, the necessary step prior to a strike. This will give us the flexibility to be able to exercise our right to self-help in the event the NMB determines further mediation will not help the parties reach an agreement. There's no set time for this to occur, it's largely driven by the state of the negotiation table. Well, can you talk to the pilots about what does a strike vote provide for us? Well, it's another important tool in the SPSC tool bag. It's confirmation for us that we have the full backing and support of our pilots. Supermajority of the pilots signaling their frustration sends a very clear message to FedEx that our pilots are willing and capable of exercising their rights under the RLA. So resorting to self-help, legally withdrawing their service, if an eventual impasse is announced and their parties reach self-help status, the announcement of a strike vote would also alert FedEx customers that we have been unable to successfully conclude negotiations and they should be planning alternate means to get, have their shipping needs taken care of in the event of a strike. Well, it's important that our pilots are aware that our RLA education that we've put out, there's a great deal of information to the pilots there, and it includes a flow chart that every pilot needs to be familiar with. Hopefully, it's either printed out or saved onto their iPad. We want the pilots to be comfortable with the process. They need to be comfortable with the process and the role that the NMB, uh, NMB has in that process. And if the pilots are, are looking for just a single source location to find all that information, please go to our website, fdxcontract2021.com. Pat, I'm going to turn to you now. Before we start talking about maybe the specific status of negotiations, can you talk a little bit about the impact uh, the tentative agreements that other airline properties have had on our negotiations? 
Sure, Chris. Well, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, you know, first, before I do that, I want the pilots now uh, to understand that we do stand on the verge of completing the largest FedEx ALPA contract in terms of overall value and perhaps the largest ALPA contract on a per pilot basis. There shouldn't be any doubt. Uh, we're not in any universe that this TA is a concessionary contract. And very much like the Delta TA and the Hawaiian TA, there are areas that were either significantly improved or more modest improvements across the board uh, regarding quality of life items, such as work rules, vacation, scheduling, and hours of service have been improved. Clearly, there's been a large win here for our pilots and our cornerstone issue. Retirement, a retirement that will set the new standard in the airline industry. So that said, we rejected every single company proposal that would have substantially harmed a pilot's quality of life or limited the pilot's ability to choose what's in their own best interest. And just to provide a more detailed example here, Chris, a small sampling of what some of the company proposed in these changes. Um, the first out of the gate issue was reducing our commercial deadheads for, so for wholesale increases to company jump seats. Uh, we, they also propose reducing minimum days off limits and adding work days in company selected short staff seats, essentially the opposite of what a 4A2B or 4A2C would have happened. Um, they also wanted to restructure substitution. They wanted to mandate pilot availability with no choice to decline at the time of to decline the trip at the time. Limit a pilot's ability to drop flying, proposing essentially forced minimum flying flight hour buildup. They also proposed to eliminate the 24 credit hours on voluntary vacation penalty payments. Amazingly, they also proposed FAR limits to all crew scheduling, essentially eliminating our more restrictive CBA limits. And lastly, Chris, but not least, they wanted to employ restrictive language and bid line adjustments by utilizing the reserve forecast model rather than the current max and open time formula. So you can see these were very drastic uh, proposals by the company and, um, you know, by and large would have absolutely been viewed as concessionary. Well, Pat, not to interrupt, but just to be clear, you're saying that these concessionary proposals by the company, the negotiating committee rejected all of them. Yes, Chris, absolutely. Well, so let me get back to the original Chris. question. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. That was my fault there, Chris. We have a little bit of a delay here. But back to your original question, um, I want to be clear about that that um, we did specifically keep open the idea that other TAs would happen and new contracts at other airlines would occur. In fact, when we started preparing our contract comparison, it was well established that we were already lagging in a few areas, including retirement and compensation compared to, to UPS. The IPA pilots, that's the union for the UPS pilots, uh, their leadership had opted for another extension to their collective bargaining agreement securing higher pay rates and additional improvements to their pension. We believe we would have the added benefit of additional contracts inside our one CBA because of the, the obviously long duration in our CBA, such as Delta, United and American. The timeline was essentially primed for that cycle to line up. But then, of course, the pandemic hit in late 2019 going into early 2020 which essentially paused all of those negotiations at the other properties as they turned their focus to pandemic style letters of agreement. What changed then? Well, uh, eventually, Chris, the, the pandemic issues were largely handled through those agreements and business began coming back. The airlines restarted uh, negotiations in earnest um, towards the end of those um, LOAs or those temporary measures. And we were aware of rapid movement towards end game negotiations. And we saw a, a TA at United, American Airlines and Delta, uh, not to mention other low cost carriers such as JetBlue and Spirit. But prior to this, however, when we began negotiating and throughout negotiations, we advised the company, cautioned them of the possibility that multiple carriers could produce TAs and we would certainly need to evaluate those patterns in particular, the pay and benefits. 
uh, look, we weren't looking to cherry pick other agreements, but we certainly needed to be able to be updating our pay and benefit comparisons as these new agreements occurred. Well, more specifically, Pat, what's the impact of these TAs? What, how how's that impacted? Well, while the United Agreement and the American deal failed ratification, one wasn't even sent to the pilots, the Delta Agreement clearly set a new benchmark in the airline industry. Fortunately, our on ongoing surveys had provided useful information on pay rates and pilot expectations. So we were in a strong position based on our initial proposed pay rates. Uh, in other words, Chris, there was no reason to adjust the pay rates as proposed. We were comfortable with the rates we had on the table. Keep in mind, we were also limited now in the ability to move much on those rates as we originally proposed them. Has Delta, is that the only comparison point at this point? Uh, no, not at all, Chris. Uh, we holistically look at the impact of every TA ratified, um, including the ones that weren't ratified as well, knowing that those aren't going to get any worse. But we look at the impact of every TA ratified, and these include the other pay rates at Hawaiian, at JetBlue. Um, and while normally, you know, the wide body scale sets up the the region for targets. In this instance, we've seen the lower narrow body pay rates drive targets as well. Um, this is a good comparison as our 757 is also our 737, even though we don't have any 73s currently on the property, um, it's banded that way, but that pay rate is less complicated when we compare it to the many banded pay rates that we see at other airlines. Well, let's move on to the current status of ne negotiations and pay is obviously one of the major items. Uh, what else is considered open? Yeah, that's right, Chris. And pay is the largest and the most contentious issue right now. But that's, of course, the pay is inextricably tied to duration and ultimately the final signing bonus, and which is designed to recover the lost pay raises since our uh, contract pay rates became stale. So that date is measured from November of 2021 through the date of signing of the new agreement. Obviously, that's contingent upon successful ratification by the pilots when they have a TA. Well, Pat, in your last communication to the pilots, you, you painted a picture of uncertainty about future mediation and waiting to hear from the actual NMB, the board members. Has anything been learned since then? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we're still waiting to hear from the NMB, but the mediator in the interim has scheduled additional negotiating meetings for the week of February 13th in Memphis. Um, and to be clear and transparent, the company must show us on paper a willingness to address our concerns and provide a comprehensive term sheet that will include pay, the signing bonus, and duration. We really have very limited opportunities remaining to conclude a deal on these final items. It would be unfortunate and very short sighted for the company right now to underestimate our pilots goals and the necessity to establish an industry leading contract. We're at an important turning point with the ratified TA. We could be able to provide labor stability in an environment in which our nearest competitor is about to engage in a predictable challenge with their union representatives for the package delivery drivers and other ground handlers. Well, if, if you reach a point where you feel like you're at an impasse, does that require the mediator declare an impasse as well? No, unfortunately, that's not how it works, Chris. Um, we certainly could identify an impasse and we would over an item or items that the mediator could agree or not. Either way, though, the decision is not up to the mediator. It's up to the board members of the National Mediation Board who determine if the parties have reached that point. If they believe that more time or meetings could resolve the difference, they will certainly make that happen. Well, thanks, Pat. Thanks for all the information today. Uh, do you have any final thoughts you'd like to share with the pilots? I sure do, Chris, and thanks for having us here today. But um, my team and I and the MEC, we understand absolutely the pilots' frustration. We understand the pilots feel frustrated that the company has not been willing to close out a deal that would finally acknowledge the dedication of our pilots, the dedication they have shown this company prior to the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after. We've been, we've been part of a team of proud professionals 
who have made a historic contribution to the success of this company. We don't have unreasonable demands. Our final contract is something that will not only acknowledge and reward the hardest working pilots in the industry, it will also clearly show pilots who are looking for their final career destination that FedEx is once again the place to be. Thanks, Pat. Chris, I'll give you the last words. Any final thoughts? Yes, Chris. To reiterate some of what has already been said, we are bound by the NMB process. This will take time. We need to remain focused on the goals that the membership gave us. I want to share one, uh, the start of an email that I recently received, and it started like this. I heard a rumor and confirmed it on Facebook. This is not the way to be informed. Stay focused. We're down to two items, two very important items. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, Pat. And thanks for watching this video. We hope you like this format. Like I said, it's a little different. If you have any questions, please go to our website, fdx.alpa.org, and utilize the DART link. And as always, be safe out there, and we'll see you next time.